You're listening to Now It's the News. I'm Beowulf Rocklin. Well, that great cinematic classic, The Wizard of Oz, was originally released 80 years ago this year, 1939. It's going to be returning to select movie theaters across the country January 27th through 30th as part of Fathom Events 2019 TCM Big Screen Classics series. It is going to be hosted by Ben Mankiewicz, TCM host. For more information, you can go to fathomevents.com slash events for tickets, for more information, and we're very privileged to have with us again Ben Mankiewicz, TCM host. Ben, welcome back to Now It's the News. Thank you so much for for being here. Always good to be with you. Thanks for uh, showing interest in these uh, thousand events, but uh, we love doing them. I love going to see them. I love TCM, watching Turner Classic Movies, of course, as well. One of the things that I note about The Wizard of Oz is that whereas I'm a huge classic movie fan, I love Gone with the Wind, I love any number that you could name from that same era, from the 1930s, from the 1940s, sometimes there's an element which you kind of have to suspend your disbelief a little bit on in terms of how it plays today. The film doesn't always age well. There's part of it that seems clunky. And I cannot think of a single part of The Wizard of Oz that doesn't age well, that you couldn't just show to any person of any age today in 2019. Why do you think it has aged so well? It's amazing in that regard. Well, it's a children's film, and children's Mm -hmm. films, you know, are, are, I don't know, they always age better, but they're generally safer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not always. Um, You know, it's just hit a sweet spot. I I don't think there's any, as you say, there's there's no particular magic to The Wizard of Oz, certainly no planning for what happened with The Mm -hmm. Wizard of Oz, and it's tremendous ability to sustain its uh, fan base over what is now 80 years. Many people, including myself, have a lot of trouble with uh, Gone with the Wind today. There are obviously many, many uh, other classic movies, just movies from 1939 that, you know, generally considered, and I think uh, justifiably so, Hollywood's greatest year, at least the Hollywood studio system's uh, greatest year. Um, but uh, uh, The Wizard of Oz, you know, has this uh, magical quality, and it still feels magical. That's a big part of it, I think, is that is that what was magical and fantastical in 1939, it has not really been eclipsed by progress, right? Right. I mean, yeah, we could we could make Dorothy's transition from Kansas to Oz um, a little more fantastic if it were made today. <laughs> it's still pretty fantastic, right? I mean, it still right. created a world that seems fantastical in, in, as fantastical in 2019 as it did in 1939. Yeah. And, and, the, and the evidence that it did that was, was the slow progress of it. The movie didn't do right. that well at the box office at the time. It wasn't that... Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't so critically well reviewed, and then it didn't get into any foreign markets because the war came. Right. Uh, and then slowly, in the years after the war, but really in the years after the war, when people watch television and it started airing on TV, that's when it uh, that's when it finally uh, that's when it caught on and, and was given the praise that it, it should have had all along. That last part that you mentioned is amazing to me. I know that it certainly had many theatrical re-releases over the course of the the decades, but to know that in the 1950s and 60s, when most of the televisions across the country were black and white ones, that it still, in spite of the fact that it didn't have the amazing dimension of of color and, and that visual aspect to it, and it was still holding people and their attention and their interest, really says a lot about the film, doesn't it? It does, yeah, and you know, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a, uh, an expert in, in the conversion to color, but mm-hmm. you know, as more and more people were buying big color TVs, I suspect yeah. that made a big difference when it came around. I suspect sure. then also that many people who knew it and had seen it on television or in re-releases, the biggest coming, I think, uh, in the '50s, early '50s, and that when MGM started realizing there was money to be made in these properties, it still had. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure some people were dazzled because they'd seen it on TV before, and now all of a sudden they're seeing it uh, in, on a color television, and it just seems, it must have seemed amazing to people. And that's still, it's still, you know, and the fact is, if it were if it were made today, I mean, I suspect mm-hmm. the, the, the Kansas scenes would be in black and white, and, yeah. and the Oz would be in color. They'd still do it. Yeah. yeah it's a yeah. great idea, for yeah. which, like, literally 38 people take credit for. <laughs> As, as I'm including, sure. including, yeah. including my grandfather. He's one of the people oh. who says it was his idea. Oh, uh, okay. He wasn't so, really known to be a liar, so uh, so I, I I'm I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give him credit. But Mervyn Leroy would disagree. But obviously, making it black and white uh, was a 
great idea. You know, it's tough because mm-hmm. this movie had four directors and something like, you know, around 15 screenwriters. Right. Um, you know, and a crazy casting history and the fact that it came together in the manner that it did is uh, is, is a, a really a testament to the studio system and a testament right. to the artists, the craftsmen uh, at MGM, who, who the behind-the-scenes, below-the-line people who put the picture together. We're speaking with Ben Mankiewicz, a host of Turner Classic Movies. Uh, we're talking about Turner Classic Movies' big screen classics re-release on the 80th anniversary of The Wizard of Oz. You can go to fathomevents.com slash events for tickets and more information. It's going to be coming up here January 27th through the 30th. It's interesting that you bring up what you just did. A lot of different people claim to have done that. So many different people were involved in the production, and often when you have multiple directors directors and casting difficulties. I know that Buddy Ebsen was originally going to be the Tin Man and he couldn't do it because the makeup involved in that made him ill. It really could have been a disaster. And I know that films such as you look at Casino Royale in the 1960s, it came out so unscathed in the final product. Why do you think with all that chaos this managed to survive? Was it just pure dumb luck or was there something essential about this movie no, that caused I, it? Like I said, I, I think that when you know when a studio like MGM, but 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 obviously others working at the top of their game, when those craftsmen, you know, it's the the art direction, the costume design, and the uh, and the sets, and obviously the the the, the, the color too here. Um, so when those people were left to do, were allowed to do their jobs properly, and then of course let's not we're we're leaving out El Frank Baum. I mean he. Right. He wrote something magical, and many of the best lines, the lines, many of the lines that we quote from The Wizard of Oz, and it has something like 20 memorable lines, many of those are right out of the book. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he, he'd been unsuccessful, Baum had, in almost everything he had done in his entire life. He had a bunch of failed businesses, and right before he published The Wizard of Oz, the first of, like, I don't know, 15 books in that series, he, uh, uh, I think he filed for bankruptcy. So he had been a failure in a number of things, and then he started writing children's books and and sort of found this magical spot. So he gets a tremendous amount of credit for giving them a, a really great story, which was hard to screw up, no matter how <laughs> much of Hollywood bled into this, and, you know, uh, you know, and trying so hard, uh, the mayor did to get to Shirley Temple, and then yeah. sort of settling for Judy Garland, as you mentioned. You know, Sondergaard out and Margaret Hamilton in as the Wicked Witch and, and, mm-hmm. the, and the Buddy Epson as the Tin Man. But he, Buddy Epson was actually the Scarecrow and Bolger as the Tin Man. And then they switched and oh. then Epson got sick and Jack, you know, so this is, but the story was so good and the artists and craftsmen below the line were so good that I think it, it came through. I, I, and, and, and all the directors, I mean, you know, it was a, it was Thorpe, Richard Thorpe and, and Cukor and, mm-hmm. and, and Victor Fleming, uh, and then King Vidor. Fleming is credited, but you know, so they lost Two of their directors wow. to Gone with the Wind. You know, wow. Both Fleming and Cukor left to do Gone with the Wind. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and but again, I, I think I think I think we should not uh, leave out uh, that, that probably most of the credit is because the story was so perfect. I know that I go through the Folger editions of Shakespeare, which I've read since I was in high school, and each of those at the end has famous lines from Hamlet or Macbeth or what have you. You could really have a Folger edition of The Wizard of Oz, and there's so many cultural catchphrases, so many touchstones that come out of that. He really did lay down an amazing map for this film to be made. We've been speaking with Ben Mankiewicz, host of Turner Classic Movies. The Wizard of Oz, originally released in 1939, will be returning to movie theaters across the country between January 27th and 30th as a part of Fathom Events 2019 TCM Big Screen Classics Series. You can go to fathomevents.com slash events for tickets and more information. And I look forward to uh, talking about some of the others in this series as the year goes on. Ben, thank you so much for spending the time and really looking forward to bringing the kids to this movie. Yeah, I'm great. I'm glad you are. Yeah, 2019 is a big year for us. So thanks. Always great to talk to you.